All right, we are we are live, Dr. Ward. So okay. I want to go ahead and give us our introduction here. Hello, everybody. Hello, Facebook world. And welcome to Mythic Mission, episode number 24. This is the way, an interview with Dr. Michael Ward with your host, Professor Michael Jahosky. Now, uh, unfortunately, we will not be talking about the Mandalorian TV show today. Fear not, for some of you, uh, I'm sure will be interested in a Mythic Mission treatment on that in the future. Uh, but today, we are talking about something much more important. You might say a more important way, a more foundational way, which C.S. Lewis called the doctrine of objective value. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with either Dr. Ward or even C.S. Lewis, you'll learn about uh, both today, and especially about C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, which um, Dr. Ward has written a guide to, which I'm going to introduce our guest here in a moment, and then we'll get into talking about his guide and the abolition itself, among other topics. So that, thank you again, Dr. Ward, for joining us. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me. So Michael Ward is a senior research fellow at Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford, and also a professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University in Texas, where he teaches in the online MA program in Christian apologetics. He is the author of the award-winning Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens in the Imagination of C.S. Lewis, which I'm very fond of, by the way, and co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis. On the 50th anniversary of Lewis's death, Professor Ward unveiled a permanent national memorial to him in Poets' Corner, Westminster Abbey. He is the co-editor of a volume of commemorative essays marking the anniversary, entitled C.S. Lewis at Poets' Corner. Michael Ward presented the BBC television documentary, The Narnia Code, directed and produced by the BAFTA-winning filmmaker Norman Stone. He authored an accompanying book called The Narnia Code, C.S. Lewis and the Secret of the Seven Heavens. Michael was resident warden at the, of the Kilns, Lewis's Oxford home from 1996 to 1999. I uh, regret that I did not ask you about that another time. I'd love to hear more about that. He studied English at Oxford, theology at Cambridge, and has a PhD in divinity from St. Andrews. But Dr. Ward's chief claim to fame, however, is that he handed a pair of x-ray spectacles to James Bond in the movie, The World Is Not Enough. So have to go and rewatch that if you have missed that. Thank you again. I'm excited about today's interview. I, in particular, was looking to, uh, to learning much from you. So thank you again. My pleasure. Yeah. What, what, what should we talk about? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, you were also on Pints with Jack. I enjoyed my time with David Bates. That was a, a fun, uh, fun interview, and uh, I enjoyed yours immensely. So I know you have been busy. I tried to design questions for the audience. Uh, that, uh, you know, most of whom are probably, I'm trying to think of many of my listeners that I know personally, not very familiar with the abolition. So we have some questions for you uh, about the abolition of uh, man itself, but also about your guide, which has some unique uh, contributions, I think, that you've, uh, you're excited to talk about. So I think the first subject, just to, uh, to get us off to a good start here, is just why did you feel the need to write this book at this time? And how long of a project have you been uh, envisioning this for some time, or...? Well, I was asked to write a foreword to a, an edition of The Abolition of Man a few years ago. And as I was writing that foreword, it, it grew and it grew and it grew. Um, and as it turned out, the foreword was never published. Uh, mm. and by a strange set of circumstances, uh, it ended up being a standalone book published by Word on Fire Academic. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the initial sort of Im impetus, that request to write the foreword. But but the reason I was interested in doing something on the abolition of man is that, um, well, first of all, I, I teach the abolition of man myself to my students, and I've noticed how difficult my students find it. Mm. Uh, and I myself have found it difficult over the years. Mm. I, I remember when I was first getting into Lewis and, and tr trying to grapple with the abolition of man that I found it very slippery and, and hard to access. So um, I want to bring a bit of light to the the subject um not just because it you know is 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 one of lewis's least accessible works but but mm. but, but, but because it's one of his most important works um it may be hard going but it's worth going with it um because it repays the effort uh he himself lewis described it as almost my favorite among my books wow walter okay. hooper lewis's editor biographer describes the abolition of man as as an all but indispensable introduction to the entire corpus of Louisiana, mm. 
-hmm. Other scholars have called it the linchpin of all his writings. Um, so it's got a very high uh, degree of uh, esteem among Lewis scholars and aficionados. Indeed. But it also has a very wide readership. Uh, this is another reason why it, it deserves having a guide written for it, that it appeals to a lot of different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. um, we have here in Britain at the moment a, a quite prominent philosopher called John Gray, who's an mm -hmm. atheist, and he, in a recent BBC radio programme, devoted the entire programme to discussing the abolition of man. Did he? He, wow. regards, he regards the abolition of man as, as prescient and prophetic and as relevant now as when it first came out, if not wow. even more so. Um, and he's an atheist. So, um, mm -hmm. And then you look at the, the more sort of expected Christian readership for the book, and you find that there again, you've got a very wide range of Christians who are interested mm -hmm. in it, all the way from, you know, an evangelical Anglican scholar like Alan Jacobs, who described it as the profoundest of all Lewis's cultural critiques, all the way over to um, Joseph Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, who of course became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, mm -hmm. and he he gave a whole talk about the abolition of man at Cambridge when he visited England a few decades ago, and described the abolition of man as as having a keen accuracy in its moral diagnosis. Mm. So you, you look at all those reasons that it's a difficult book, but it's an important book. It's one that Lewis highly regarded. It's one that other scholars have regarded highly, and it has this wide audience. And you think, why has a guide to the abolition of man not been written long before this? Uh, yes. it's, it's long overdue. Yes, that's um, that's profound. And you know, I'm uh, familiar with John Gray. Uh, before I forget, I think he has a book, Seven Types of Atheism. If I, I have to recall, yes. I think yeah. some, something yeah. to that extent. And I remember reading yes. it some years ago. Um, I, I'm struck by how important this subject is for for even people who are, uh, you know, might count themselves secular because Lewis, as we'll get to this, Lewis's argument is arguably from a very general perspective. He's not trying to make an explicit, as you say, uh, apologetic of Christianity as he does in, say, mere Christianity. And so it's one that appeals to people who, who may not share our framework, our worldview. So that's a very, very uh, you know, awe-inspiring for me to hear that he gave a whole program on that. Uh, and uh, very good. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I, I didn't want to surprise you with this, but just if we have the time, and I think we do just for a brief second, you, you yourself are Catholic, and I wanted to ask you how you came to be Catholic, if, if it uh, won't take too long. Do you feel like you could speak to that? You weren't always Catholic, were you? You were. I was born and raised in, in an Anglican household, ah. uh, a sort of conservative evangelical Anglican household, yeah and grew up, was baptized and confirmed as an Anglican, and indeed became an Anglican clergyman, mm -hmm. um, and was a chaplain first at Cambridge and then here at Oxford. Um, and then I became a Catholic in 2012. Oh, wow. And became a Catholic priest in 2018, though I'm not dressed today like a Catholic <laughs> priest. <laughs> and I earn my living, I ought to say. I, I, yeah. I earn my, my daily bread, um, <laughs> use that loaded term. Uh, yes as an academic. So mm -hmm. I, I teach here at Oxford and for Houston Baptist University, and I assist as a in, in a local Catholic parish here in Oxford. Um, but it has its own regular full-time parish priest, and I, I, I'm just an extra pair of hands, as it were. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the story of how I became a Catholic is, is long and convoluted and, and sure. terribly relevant to the abolition of man. Um, no, that's fine. So, yeah. Perhaps we could leave that for another day. Of um, course, of course. I have talked and written about it elsewhere. So if, oh, okay. if, you, if your listeners want to explore that, um, mm. they can turn up a book called Mind, Mind, Heart and Soul, Intellectuals and the Path to Rome, um, oh. in, which, in which I have an interview on, the, on, the, on this very topic. Excellent. Um, but yeah, um, talk, talk, let's, seg let's segue from Catholicism into yeah. after humanity. And, um, Please, yeah. Because... Because it's interesting that after humanity it is what might be called uh, a defense of natural law. Mm -hmm. and, and natural law is, is, is a big thing uh, for Catholics. It, it tends to be a much bigger thing than for your average Protestant. Mm -hmm. But of course, Lewis was not a Catholic. He was an Anglican, um, but he had a great respect for natural law and nat natural theology, um, what you might call 
common grace. Mm -hmm. um, what St. Paul writes about in the early chapters of the letter to the Romans, where he's talking about how, how God's invisible properties are, are visible from what has been made and how uh, even the Gentiles who are outside the law are a law unto themselves because they have a they have their conscience, which now acquits them, now condemns them. Um, so there's a certain level of general revelation which God makes to all people. And, th and that's the subject for natural theology. Uh, and natural law is an element of natural theology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all this can be accessed without special revelation, without right. specific uh, reliance upon the Bible or the church or or particular interventions of the Holy Spirit, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's the tradition that Lewis is appealing to in the abolition of man. He, he's wanting to, to see, as it were, what, what progress we can make under our own steam, mm -hmm. uh, how, how much we can come to know of the good, the true and the beautiful, right. simply as human beings. Now, of course, Lewis is a Christian um, and believes that human beings are made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. so they're, there, there is under, there is above and around and beneath his his natural theology, uh, a more specifically Christian theology, of course, but he he tries to keep that in the background. He, he doesn't yeah. intrude it into the abolition of man. And indeed, he says in the course of the abolition of man that though I am myself a theist and indeed a Christian, I am not attempting here any even indirect argument for theism, mm. not even an indirect argument. Saying a lot. Theism. Let, let alone a direct argument for Christianity. <laughs> so all he's trying to do is establish the objectivity of value. He's mm -hmm. trying to show that goodness is a real thing which all human beings can get access to mm -hmm. simply by, by virtue of their human nature, um, which is the same whether you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, secularist, atheist, whatever. Mm -hmm. we, we all have the same basic faculty. This conscience this ability to determine or to discern the the good the true and the beautiful yes. and and that's why he i think has has a has a has, a, has acquired such a, a wide readership that mm -hmm. an atheist like john gray can find a lot that he will agree with in the abolition of man because mm -hmm. it's it's pro pro propounded from a purely philosophical point of view it, it's not it's nothing theological it's not a specifically christian apologetic mm -hmm. um and and if listeners, viewers want to see how Lewis gets from this purely philosophical argument into a more obviously Christian argument, then I would suggest they, they, they look at mere Christianity, because the first four chapters of mere Christianity are like a, a popular version of the abolition of man. Right. Again, those first four chapters of mere Christianity are philosophical, but right. he doesn't stop there. He goes on to make, make the the bridging arguments first of all into theism and then into christianity um, but that's not his aim here in the abolition of man he's setting his sights very low in the abolition of man low but deep and detailed and that for sure um, requires such unpacking mm. yes there's there's a lot there i think people uh who are listening and watching are going to be interested i have some questions i don't want to say too much now that will touch on some of the things that you said but the idea that uh, objective value is real as i said to you before the interview started you know a hard concept for a lot of people who think it's all reduced to feelings and what i think a lot of folks don't realize is that feelings are still a part of this framework when we accept the doctrine of objective value and so i think this will be a revelation for uh, many people listening and i look forward to getting into those subjects uh, a little later on down the line but first could you tell us a little bit more about the context in which the abolition of man was written by lewis when, where, why? It was written in 1943, and it originated as three lectures in philosophy that he gave at the University of Durham here in England. Um, they at Durham have an annual lecture series called the Riddle Memorial Lecture Series, and, and Lewis's involvement was the 15th series. It's still mm. going today, as it happens. Um, wow. And uh, he elected to choose this particular topic um, and I think part of the difficulty of the abolition of man arises from the fact that it, it, it did 
originate in this high level academic context mm -hmm. you know a guest lecture series at another university and lewis knew that if if his audience didn't immediately pick up on certain points they could pepper him with questions at the end mm -hmm. um, he naturally expected that it would be published like all the lecture series for the riddle memorials are, are published but i don't suppose he necessarily thought that it would become the classic that it has become mm. um, and indeed he was rather disappointed with the uh, the initial sales um and he said it had been totally ignored by the public or almost totally ignored mm -hmm. um, but but he was a bit mistaken about that uh, it actually sell, sold very well um for a work of this kind academic philosophy <laughs> and um, and got good reviews and um of course it didn't sell as well as the screw tape letters or the narnia books oh yeah <laughs> of course it never would right um, <laughs> but anyway you're asking about why why he wrote it well be because two reasons one subjectivism the idea that value is purely a a personal projection mm -hmm. subjectivism was was gaining ground in in the philosophical world in the in the first half of the 20th century and lewis wanted to beat it back as it were and, and show its deficiencies but also personally uh, in lewis's own life he himself had grappled with subjectivism he talks about his own vicious subjectivisms in um, in his autobiography surprised by joy mm -hmm. um, he himself had felt the strength or, or the lure of subjectivism but he'd also found ways of of overcoming it and having overcome subjectivism in his own life he was all the more keen to explain to other people um, its deficiencies as a philosophy Mm -hmm. there, there were both personal reasons for the abolition of man and more general cultural reasons why why he wanted to tackle it as a topic sure and, um, and he did so in this very ingenious way um by by first of all tackling a school textbook mm -hmm. which discusses a waterfall and whether the waterfall should be called sublime or pretty and um, this school textbook, um, <laughs> yeah, hence, hence the waterfall on the cover of, of my guide. Um, mm -hmm. Should the waterfall be sublime or should it be called pretty? And does mm. it really matter anyway? Because if value is purely a projection from our own personal opinion, then if you think it's sublime and I think it's pretty, who, who's to adjudicate between us? It, it, it just means whatever we choose to call it, doesn't it? Um, but Lewis said, no, 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 no. Um, there, there, there may be cases when there's a legitimate argument to be had about a particular waterfall as, as to as to the precise best description for it but only if you and i agree that there is a waterfall there with with inherent intrinsic properties can you and i have any discussion about it being sublime or pretty uh, and hopefully between us you know iron sharpening iron and all that mm -hmm. we, and we can knock sparks off each other and come to a closer and truer identification of the value of the thing we're looking at. But if if it's purely subjective, then there's no point in talking about it at all. You know, subjectivism just cuts the legs from under all uh, conversation, all inquiry, all intellectual endeavor whatsoever. It's, sure. it's it's a kind of mental suicide to adopt a thoroughgoing subjectivism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think, and that, that leads us to the first chapter of the abolition, because what I think Lewis feared was happening in his own time and why somebody like Gray is saying this is a prophetic book is happening uh, quite a bit in our own is we have created people with men without chests. Uh, and that is the first chapter of the abolition I'm sure people want to hear about what exactly Lewis means by that, because it, you know, it could go in many different directions. So uh, the, the pitfalls of subjectivism and, and where that leads, I think, in part is what he means by that. Uh, but could you expound a little bit on chapter one? What is Lewis's goal? What is his main aim in Men Without Chess, chapter one of the abolition of man? So yeah, Lewis has a, 
a philosophical model of the human person in three parts the head the chest and the belly mm. and he's arguing that in the head we have access to the spirit of rationality we we can reason we can we can make conclusions that are logical um and and in that respect we we participate in a in a spirit of rationality which is is which is like what is available to the angels mm -hmm. or indeed to the demons from the ch chest downwards from the you know the belly downwards we have sensations we have emotions and passions and appetites which we share with the animals um in the chest we have the liaison officer between cerebral man and visceral man mm -hmm. it's the chest which is the archetypally human faculty because from the neck up we're like the angels from the sternum down we're like the beasts but a man a human being is a rational animal to use the, the classic definition mm -hmm. we we shouldn't be ashamed of our animality sensations feelings passions appetites they're all good in so in you know in in essence mm -hmm. but they need to be ordered they they need to be stabilized and so that and they they are ordered and stabilized by the exercise of r practical reason in the head mm -hmm. but mediated through the chest um the chest is like a kind of um a a, a, a gear that meshes the head and the belly um it's what prevents the head from either squelching the belly and denying that we're physical creatures at all or the other way around it's what prevents the belly from rising up and overwhelming rationality so that we mm. become indistinguishable from the from the beasts um so to combine the angel and the animal and you have the anthropological you have mm -hmm. that which is truly human combine the human brain and the human belly in the human breast and you have the human being mm. and this is where s sentiments become stabilized and regularized lewis isn't wanting to th thrust feelings out of the picture altogether he's just wanting to say feelings must be ordered and made just and civilized um, so that they accord with reality. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes. And uh, I know that this is a, a topic we've talked about on Mythic Mission several times, uh, the idea of truth conforming to reality. This is not, of course, every person's understanding of truth, but Aristotle's old correspondence theory, uh, true statements are that which conform to reality. And I know in a, maybe another talk, we can talk about the role of the imagination and reason, which I think plays into this very nicely, uh, perhaps have you on the show again. Um, but I think that frames uh, what, I, what I wanted uh, you to address, uh, uh, the anthropology that uh, Lewis talks about in the abolition of man. So what is his uh, concern about, he concludes chapter one with this idea of men without chess. So what, is, what does that mean? Is that this is a bad thing? Um, yes, it yeah. is. Because the chest is the definitively human faculty. Right. And it's what combines the head to the belly and the belly to the head and mm. if you if you don't try to have any kind of in <clears throat> these two faculties then you'll you'll soon find that you you capsize in one direction or the other mm. you'll either become it and indeed the, these two capsizings may alternate very rapidly you may suddenly become excessively cerebral right um, sterile as it were in your own reasoning uh, or you may become excessively fertile in your passions right. um, but the idea of the of the human person is is the garden neither the yeah. desert nor the jungle but the garden and, and here i'm alluding to the four loves mm. uh, where lewis talks about the human person as a garden mm -hmm. um, and men without chests are, are people who 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 are who are now one thing and now the other, but they have no core. They have no capacity for integrating, no capacity for integrating their their thoughts and their feelings, mm -hmm. and that's why you get this terrible dichotomy in in modern philosophy between facts and feelings. Yes, mm -hmm. but there, there there is no 
uh, opposition or polarization between these two necessarily no. if the chest is operating properly. Mm. A very important uh, intermediary and middleman. Uh, so this is this is a great segue to get into uh, something uh, that Lewis talks about in chapter two, the way he uses a Chinese concept, the Tao, uh, which I don't know that many of our listeners will be familiar with, but some will. Um, and I have a question for you later about why Lewis chose that particular term. We can elaborate a little bit more, but uh, obviously Lewis felt that kind of understanding the doctrine of objective value would in ensure that at least properly done that men would retain their chests. So what does he talk about in chapter two of the abolition of man, the way? Yeah, so the way is, is an English translation really of that Chinese word Tao, um, T-A-O. And um, Lewis deliberately goes all the way over to Confucian philosophy and mm. that term to denote this moral ecology, this way of being human, this uh, objective framework or fund or reservoir of moral values. He, he deliberately uses that Eastern term mm -hmm. as a way of emphasizing his point that what he's talking about is, is universal. He's not talking about a particularly Christian thing or even a Western thing more generally. He's talking about a fundamentally human thing, which all human beings have access to. And that's why, incidentally, at the end of the abolition of man, he has an appendix in which he lists eight different moral rules or duties. And in support of each one of these eight, he cites any number of traditions from around the world and down through history. Um, yes. Hindu, Babylonian, ancient Egyptian, Norse, Aboriginal Australian, Native American, Christian, Hebrew, um, any number of different traditions, all of them supporting his contention that uh, human beings around the world and down through history have have come to remarkably similar conclusions about what makes for the good life. Right. That we do, we all have, we all recognise that we have duties to our ancestors and to our elders. We all recognise that we have duties to our children and posterity. We all recognise that we have a law of general beneficence and the law of special beneficence pressing upon us we all recognize that that there is something called veracity truth telling mm. and societies want people to tell the truth not tell lies mm. um, no society mm. would ever admire a person who you know threw down his arms in battle and and ran away you know so cowardice is a mm. bad thing bravery is a good thing um even suffering and dying for the good may be necessary. And that, that's going to be an important element of Lewis's whole argument, which yes. we may come back to. Um, so this is, this is the way of being human. This is the Tao. Um, and it's interesting that he uses the term Tao rather than way, um, yeah. usually, because, as I say, it's a way of wrong footing those who assume he's just making a a Christian argument. Christian but, for point, those, yeah. but for those who are literate with with the Bible, they they will hear even in the word "way" mm -hmm. an echo of of Christianity, because the early Christians in the Acts of the Apostles were called the followers of the way, mm -hmm. and Jesus himself describes himself as the way and the truth and the life. So Lewis is sort of with a nod and a wink, you might say, to his Christian readers. He's saying, "Yeah, I'm talking about something which is philosophically." Uh, defensible, mm -hmm. but it's also theologically compatible with my mm -hmm. Christian commitments. Uh, so, of course, mm -hmm. we, we to say that the, the abolition of man is not a Christian apologetic is not at all to say that it's somehow less than Christian. It's entirely in accord uh, and comports with Lewis's Christian commitments. It's just only the first few steps in in a in a defense of Christianity. Certainly. And I'm uh, glad you mentioned the appendix. For those of you that didn't catch that, the appendix to the abolition of man does have uh, a listing from, uh, I think, a pretty global selection of cultures that uh, have these same values in which they, first of all, believe in objective value to begin with, but in, in, in including agreement on particulars in, in some occasions. Now, I know in my classes, when we do ethics, one of the difficulties is you know, okay, everyone has different values. So, you know, one culture may feel, you know, treating women this way is okay, but another culture may say it, it isn't. 
And they have a hard time reconciling how there can be a doctrine of objective value knowing that they completely disagree. And I think you say somewhere, uh, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, I think um, another question, but that you know, what, how we know is subjective, but what we know is objective. And I think that's a very valuable point that will, will lead to some thinking for a lot of people that we may come to different conclusions about, as you alluded, how we bury our dead, how we treat our children, how we you know, consider what to be honor, but we don't disagree about these things being objective realities. And that, I think, if you can understand that, we can go further and understand what Lewis is doing um, so just, a, I wanted to get that in there, but I know chapter three now, and then we can get into some more specific questions in your book and talk about some other unique aspects of your book that I'm excited to discuss with you. So to finish out the abolition in our overview, chapter three is the abolition of man. It's the title of the, the work. Um, summarize for us what he does in that final chapter. What did he mean by abolition? The third lecture, yes, is called The Abolition of Man, like, mm -hmm. the, the, like the book as a whole. And mm -hmm. th this, is, this is a more alarming and um, almost dystopian forecast of, of where subjectivism will take us. Uh, it will take us to a very dark and unhappy place um, in which human beings are no longer human beings, but merely artifacts um, made thus and thus by irrational factors. Um, either untrammeled will or appetite or random association of ideas or the weather or your indigestion or your heredity mm. or, or any other sort of factor which may have a bearing upon what you choose at any particular time to regard as good. Um, but nearly always it will devolve into some kind of power play um, this is this is why uh, uh the the picture lewis paints is so dystopian because um scratch a relativist or scratch a subjectivist and, and you find a fascist you find a dictator hence joseph ratzinger's famous lines about the di dictatorship of relativism um that if if there is no such thing as objective value connecting my perspective with your perspective different though they may be um, if there's no such common ground then i'm thrown back entirely upon my own resources in order to defend my corner because there's only me against the world there's, there's not me and the, and the ground in front of me <laughs> so I, I have to be terribly ferocious about defending my corner and imposing my will upon yours so that I get what I want and prevent mm. you from getting what you want. Um, so it's the law of the jungle very quickly uh, if, sub if subjectivism turns out to be true. Yeah. And uh, it's a very, very bleak picture that Lewis paints. Uh, so it's quite a negative account that Lewis ends on. A yeah. kind of downbeat note and um, and in, in that respect, it's quite uncharacteristic of C.S. Lewis, because most of Lewis's books end on very bright notes. He nearly yeah. always ends his books on some kind of depiction of heaven or the beatific vision or something very, very positive. Yeah. But here he's saying, no, 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 if we, if, we see <laughs> through subject, if we see through objective value, if we all become subjectivists, then effectively we're seeing through first principles. Um, we're wanting to make that which is naturally opaque to us transparent mm. we're trying to see through it but a wholly transparent world he says is an invisible world mm -hmm. see through all things is the same as not to see mm. effectively we're making ourselves morally blind if if we take the full dive into subjectivism we mm. need to retain some element of opacity in our world some things which are just paradigmatically fundamental they, they are mm. not conclusions or else we'll have no firm ground to build any edifice whatsoever so what, he, what he's really trying to do in the in the abolition of man is is defend um defend first principles he's trying to defend that which should be self-evident to us the objectivity of value should be self-evident to us yeah. it's something that we discover it's not something we invent it's like the truths of mathematics 
we discover them we don't invent them and we, can't, we can't live a human life in any other way mm. than by recognizing this moral framework this structure of moral reality which we find pressing upon ourselves if yeah. we try to throw it we're heading towards disaster what does he say uh it's like the rebellion of the branches against the tree i think and that's from the abolition i think it's from the third yeah. part yeah and um he says elsewhere i know you, you mentioned the window quote he says the point of seeing through things or see, seeing through something is to see something through it and that always throws my students uh, when i quote them like wow they'll sit five minutes thinking about that he had a way with words um and it really does cause you to think about where ultimately subjectivism would would lead us to getting rid of ourselves everything that we hold dear and the very notion that we ourselves as you say in your book too are objective realities it's mm. not just what's outside us but we are real yeah. i mean i know that's what philosophers argue about so uh you know that's up for contention for some but yeah i think this is um a great segue into my next question it, it's a bit of a question but i also just wanted to share from page 21 of your book um, so let me read uh, something briefly here and then I'll ask my question. So this is page uh, 21 of After Humanity, Your Guide. And uh, there's actually a couple of things, but this is the line that I wanna ask you about. Recognition of objective value is a kind of irreligion underlying them all. And indeed all traditional philosophies and coherently logical systems of thought whatsoever. And there's this indispensable sense that you give us here um, in recognizing the doctrine of objective value. So my question, you know, is, is simply this. Could you explain perhaps briefly, because I, I know there's some uh, other uh, questions I still want to ask you, why belief in objective value is so foundational to any worldview? Because I hear a lot of pushback. Well, that's just a Christian thing. I've heard that from some of my students. It, no, that's not for everybody. And I think that's obviously very confused. So why is um, belief in objective value so foundational to any perspective? Because if, if you want to uh have any kind of intellectual discourse about anything whatsoever mm. um you've got to take take uh, as a given that there's something to be talked about something <laughs> which is different from you and different from your interlocutor something common to both but identifiable with neither precisely mm. um so that progress in understanding can be made yeah. but if if there is no if there's if there's no world outside your head then we're all locked up in our own solipsistic solitary confinement mm -hmm. and there, there can be no there, there's no point in even saying that i disagree with christianity if if i've already taken a subjectivist point of view i can only say i disagree with christianity if i if i accept objective value um precisely it's it's foundational to all inquiry all philosophizing all science all mm. art all, all human endeavor um yeah. and this this is why uh lewis's book is so hard i think for for some people to get their heads around because he's he's as it were he's he's trying to defend something which which ought not to require any defense and indeed yeah. which in practical terms does require no defense because nobody actually can lead their lives consistently and honestly <laughs> as subjectivists mm. it just does not work no. because if subjectivism were true we how would we know that it was true <laughs> what would true mean in a subjectivist frame of reference it would mean true for me but then it wouldn't necessarily mean that subjectivism was true for you mm. it, it might be that objectivism is true for you and then, <laughs> but how how would that then impact upon my subjectivism if objectivism is true for you? so it, it just makes no sense it's circular it, it's, the, it's the rebellion of the branches against the tree yeah um, it's it's it requires a level of self-defeating rigor which is hard to keep up for any length of time yes um, and as soon as someone suggests that they're a subjectivist all you need to ask them is are you sure about that are you saying that subjectivism is true? And as soon as they say subjectivism is true, they've cut off the bow that they're sitting on. That's right. And I, I'm, I'm thinking it's in his essay, The Poison of Subjectivism, which I, I feel somehow you mentioned in your book. 
what does he say? You don't know a line is crooked unless you know what a straight one looks like. Yeah. And, and this is always a great mental image to keep in mind to kind of wrap up what you just said. Uh, and it, it's just, as I said, it's so baffling how we need to defend this. But I think showing our students and, and people we, we spend our time with the, um, the naturalness with which we assume this doctrine of objective value is, is part of what should be a strong Christian apologetic. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but I have another question for you. Thank you so much for that. Um, my next one has to do about, you mentioned in your book, why the abolition is really not a, um, an explicitly theological argument. You, know, you mentioned earlier, it touched on this, it doesn't require belief in special revelation. It doesn't require one to be a Christian or any religion. Um, and so was this Lewis's way, uh, and I think you've already touched on this, so it's kind of half answered, of showing how far human reason or general revelation, common grace gets us unaided by faith? Do you think that he was trying to show that maybe with a wink and a nod, as you said earlier, to, to some of his audience? This is how far human reason could take us, but... Yeah, I mean, Lewis had a great respect for human reason and, um, and describes himself in one place as a rationalist. Mm. Um, and yeah, ha having trained in classical philosophy at Oxford and having started his academic career teaching in philosophy in, and indeed focusing upon uh, value as, as his philosophical target, um, he, he knew very well what he was talking about. Um, you know, th this wasn't just a, a kind of tactic um, to, to reel people into a Christian worldview because right. Lewis had taken, had taken, had adopted this stance himself before he became either a theist or a Christian. You know, he believed in the objectivity of value before either of those conversions came about. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he believed it, he, he knew it from within. Um, and I have a whole chapter about, about the, or, or the biographical background. Um, this is one of the reasons why the abolition man has such impact that it springs from Lewis's own personal experience. He's, mm -hmm. he's not just taking pot shots at some convenient target over there um, he, he's not just point scoring, he's actually <laughs> giving us the fruit of his own internal wrestling with this topic. And that's why I, I quote in, in, the, in the final chapter of my guide, uh, W.B. Yeats's famous line about how when we quarrel with others, we just produce rhetoric. When we quarrel with ourselves, we produce poetry. Mm. And Lewis quarreled with himself, as it were, about subjectivism in his early years. And as a result, what he produces is not mere rhetoric. He's not just sounding off. It's not just angry polemic against those terrible subjectivists over there. Yeah. He's actually saying, I know what this is like. I've, I've been there. I've struggled with it. I, I've seen through it. I, I've seen its deficiencies. Mm. Um, and, and I think this speaks to the point you just made about how, in one sense, it's baffling that people should ever dispute the reality, the objectivity of value. In one sense, it is baffling, but in another sense, it's all too understandable mm. because all of us like to make exceptions about the objectivity of value when it suits us. <laughs> That's the truth. This is called <laughs> sin. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Self-serving dodge. And that's really what subjectivism is. It's, it's a kind of way of saying, well, I'll, I'll be as objective as I need to be. Right. I'll be as subjective as I possibly can be. And that way you, you think you're going to get the best of both worlds, but it just ends up with you being unhappy. Right. And that reminds me of Peter Kreft uh, made a comment once in one of his many books I've read. Maybe it was the philosophy of Tolkien. Um, I can't recall. But we, you know, we believe truth is objective when people are telling us nice things about ourselves and, uh, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, I'm the greatest ever. And then when somebody has a criticism, we, we oh, that's just your opinion. Thank goodness. It's, it's interesting how we flip flop with that. And, and I, I'm so grateful that you pointed out it is understandable why people would adopt this view. And so I think it's important uh, to point that out. And I also think it's valuable. And this is my, my last official kind of content question that we'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, the, that hideous strength. I think maybe that would be the last content question. Um, but what I'd like to, to really kind of get at here just is this idea of Lewis understood this perspective. He sympathized with it. I think this made him in his other works a more thoughtful apologist 
So on page 42 of your book, After Humanity, you have this fantastic summary, I think, of our current cultural predicament. And I'm going to read as much of it as I can just within time constraints here. Uh, but if you get Dr. Ward's book, it's on page 42, uh, chapter six uh, of his book. And uh, I think my question here is just this, how can understanding what I'm about to read help shape our apologetic in today's world? And here's what you say, the pervasive, almost ubiquitous acceptance of various kinds of emotivism and subjectivism in modern Western culture means there can be no persuasion. That is to say, rational argument leading to a freely adopted change of mind. Uh, I'll read one more sentence because it's very good. <laughs> Rather, as belief in objective value evaporates and the public square is evacuated of practical reason, what passes for moral discourse increasingly resembles a war zone in which political propagandists, commercial interests, private whims, and animal instincts fight tooth and nail in a permanent free-for-all. So knowing this, especially that line about there can be no persuasion, how, how, should, we, how should we witness? Do you have any practical advice or insight there given given this uh predicament we're in <clears throat> well one thing practically to take away from lewis's book is is a firm belief in the objectivity of value um and you if if one is interacting with people who who try to pretend otherwise you can point out charitably enough i hope um the inconsistency of, of the position that they're adopting. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we're talking here amongst Christians, um, Christians themselves should, within their own debates with one another, uh, manifest a spirit of rationality, of reasonable discourse, um, and not just try to, to put a fast one over against our opponents in, in intra-Christian disputes. So we can, to a certain extent, hopefully model what it means to believe in the objectivity of value. Um, and the third thing I would say is that more generally, um, the objectivity of value may require us to suffer. Mm. And, and this is a really important point in Lewis's argument. I mentioned it earlier. Um, he says that the crucial test of the objectivity of value is, is our willingness to suffer and even die in defense of the right. He, he quotes the ancient Roman poet Horace, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It's yeah. sweet and seemly to die for one's country. And he also brings in alongside that Jesus's words in the gospel, uh, greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends yeah. and lewis describes this as the crucial test of the objectivity of value because it's only when we potentially suffer and maybe even die in defense of a good cause that we prove to ourselves that value is indeed objective because if it were merely subjective if it was just the result of the projection from our own will or appetite well as soon as we might have to start suffering for it we could change it couldn't we so that we could stop suffering yeah. the very fact that we go on suffering and maybe even dying um on this particular point whatever it may be shows us that we really do believe in objective value mm -hmm. um so i think an important point here is is for all of us in whatever you know particular realm of life it may be personal or public or um, theological or political, social, whatever it may be, whatever position we're taking, um, we need to model the ability to, to suffer mm. in defense of that which we know to be good, true and beautiful. Yes. Um, and that, that's not a very attractive manifesto. <laughs> But, but it's absolutely crucial, yes. crucial, the experimentum crucis. Um, and, and so that's why, or one of the reasons why Lewis ends the abolition of man in, in the appendix with, mm. with a quotation from Jesus. It's not a Christian apologetic. 
but he ends on a profoundly Christian note by quoting mm. Jesus' words in John's Gospel, unless a seed die, unless a grain of wheat die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. In other words, he who is unprepared to suffer, mm. who is unprepared to die in defense of the good cause, will, will lose everything that makes life worth living in any case. Um, Wow. So I think th this is the profoundest takeaway from the abolition of man. Um, that you know, if if for instance we do something wrong, if if we get caught out lying or stealing or something, what's the best thing to do as a Christian? The best thing is just to fess up immediately. I I did something wrong. I apologize. I was wrong. I will not do it again. I will take any punishment that comes my way, and I will learn from this experience. That would be. The, the best thing to do no, not just as a Christian but as you know just as an honest minded human being um, <clears throat> the bad thing to do would be to try to wriggle out of it and say well it doesn't apply to me or I or I, I was forced to do it by someone else or mm. it, it's all a lie um, <laughs> and that that way um, d disaster lies yes that is a, a very profound and fitting conclusion. There's uh, just one thing I wanted to say. Um, this reminds me of the, the first disciples and the, a, a very powerful testimony to the belief that the first Christians believed in the objectivity of what had happened in history with Christianity and that many of them uh, died for it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's also fitting to mention that. Now, I technically do have one more content question for you. Do you have a few more minutes in you? I know you must be very tired. Yeah, let's carry on for a bit. Yeah. So I want to, two things. I want to ask you about the photo gallery, but I figured before we got to that, so we could finish on a light aesthetic note, um, and there's something I want to mention about aesthetics, uh, if I can remember later. I wanted to talk briefly, for those that may find the philosophical nature of the abolition to be a bit much, Many of us enjoy stories and we enjoy indirect communication. Now, I know most everybody's heard of the Chronicles of Narnia. I myself came late to the Ransom trilogy and I'm still working through it. Uh, the third part in particular of the Ransom trilogy, that hideous strength you say in your book is, uh, I won't say an exemplification, but it illustrates certain ideas in Lewis's own words uh, from the abolition of man do you have a favorite uh, insight? Maybe just tell us briefly about what the Ransom Trilogy is about and pick one way in which it, it really shows the arguments that we've talked about here today. Well, there's so much to say. Um, I know. <laughs> and all I will say is that, yes, if you find the abolition of man difficult, yeah. read the Ransom Trilogy and indeed focus upon that hideous strength, the third mm -hmm. book, because as Lewis says in the preface to that hideous strength, uh, the novel has behind it a serious point, which I have tried to make in my Abolition of Man. So yeah, that hideous strength is a kind of fictional counterpart to the Abolition of Man. And, and there in the novel, you see dramatized and concretized um, the relatively abstract argument of the abolition. Mm. Um, perhaps the most obvious carryover between the two works is, is on this idea of men without chests, because mm. The villains of that hideous strength, the baddies, um, they worship a a decapitated head. Um, it's it's the head of a villain. Uh, it's, the, it's the head of a French criminal, which has been severed and and kept alive by artificial means, and it's now fixed up on a bracket on the wall and kept alive with tubes and saliva and various devices <laughs> to keep it breathing. Um, and of course, when you see a man without a chest and indeed without even a belly either um you see the the horror of of what lewis is is depicting it, it's a he, wow. he really spare, he doesn't spare your your um susceptibilities in that hideous strength it's, it's quite gruesome in places yeah. but, but rightly so and and delightfully beautiful and happy in other places it's a mm. brilliant brilliant work that hideous strength um one of my favorite works of all of c.s lewis's works mm -hmm. um but I wouldn't, I mean, that hideous strength can be read on its own, but it's best read as the third book in, in the trilogy. Mm -hmm. and the first two books are relatively difficult, I think. They're, they are ways of, of Lewis um, structuring his larger case about gender 
because mm. that's what the trilogy is finally about gender the first book is set on masculine mars and the second book is set on feminine venus and mm -hmm. the third book opens with the word matrimony uh, and it's all about whether this young human couple, Mark and Jane, are going to be truly masculine and feminine, respectively, and thus save their marriage, or whether they're not. Wow. Um, so the, that's, uh, another, that's another way in which that hideous strength ties over to abolition, um, about what constitutes a, a true marriage. Yeah, I uh, I can't wait to get to it. I'm still working through Out of the Silent Planet, and I, I'm actually using uh, Dr. Hale's guide side by side as I as I read chapter by chapter. I'm not peeking. I'm trying very hard, uh, and it's been delightful. So, but it, I can see it's difficult. There's there's also a lot of you know in house vocabulary, just like Tolkien has, and of course that can be difficult for some. Uh, but thank you for sharing that with us. I wanted to to make sure we got that in. But to to conclude. Um, and I'll say my, uh, my word about aesthetics, what we've talked about here today applies, I think, also to art and to the realm of, of beauty. And so as there is objectivity in, in uh, the realm of ethics and, and, of course, in talking about truth, uh, there is in um, discussing art. And you have a beautiful photo gallery from, uh, in your book that, that pulls from the life of uh, Lewis and those that he mentions. I know we didn't talk about the Green Book and kind of who he's kind of indirectly addressing in the abolition, but tell us about what makes this such a, um, a special part of your book, After Humanity, the photo gallery, please. I wanted to include pictures, because I, I always think that pictures, if they're well chosen and if they're well captioned, they really add to a work of, of otherwise purely verbal communication. Um, I mean, I'm quite a verbal person. I think I'm principally a verbal learner, but I, I have realized increasingly over the years that I'm also a visual learner. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I was delighted when the publisher's Word on Fire Academic allowed me to include 30 pages of, of photographs and pictures, many of them in glorious Technicolor. Mm. And um, <laughs> I'll just mention a few, a few of these images. Uh, one I'm particularly proud of is, is Lewis's original blurb for The Abolition of Man. Um, here, here it is in Lewis's handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, I found this in the archives of the University of Durham and no, no other scholar, not even the late great Walter Hooper, seems to have known about this. It's never been published before, but it's wow. Lewis's own little blurb describing The Abolition of Man. It's, it's not actually a very good blurb, <laughs> but it's interesting <laughs> to see how at least he attempted to blurb his own book. So that's included for the first time. Um, wow. Uh, then some of the intellectual figures that he's engaging with, like I.A. Richards and A.J. Ayer, they get mm. photographs too. And both of these men, Lewis knew and interacted with. Um, he debated with A.J. Ayer in Oxford and described him privately as a cross between a rodent and a firefly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and on wow. learning this, A.J. Ayer remarked, I didn't feel altogether flattered, but I had some idea what Lewis <laughs> meant. <laughs> wow. Okay. And so there are nice little sort of human and humorous interactions that I was able to turn up in the course of the book, and they, they sort of get reflected in these pictures. Mm. And finally, um, just a third of three examples to cite. Um, I was talking about death for a good cause, and... I think it's important to recognize that Lewis himself had very nearly died in defense of his own country during the First World War. He'd been a soldier. He'd been a second lieutenant in the British Army during the... Thank you. And there we have the picture of him in uniform. That's the only picture of him uh, as an officer cadet. And that group photograph on the other page shows you not just Lewis, but also his great friend Paddy Moore. Um, mm. Paddy alas, was killed in the First World War. And as a result, Lewis's life took a completely different route from what it might otherwise have taken, because Lewis spent the rest of his life living, or most of the rest of his life, looking after Paddy's mother and Paddy's sister. Mm. Um, and so this question of death for a good cause was not just some intellectual abstraction for Lewis. It was something which confronted him and Mrs. Moore and Maureen Moore every morning of their lives as they they looked at the empty table at the breakfast at the empty chair at the breakfast table mm. paddy was dead he died for his country did it 
mean anything? Had it any kind of value to it? Was it just complete waste? Yeah. And that's the question underlying the abolition of man, mm -hmm. um, whether there can be any objective value, even in death. Right. Um, so I'm very pleased that this photograph of, of the of the officer cadets has has been published before, but never with both Lewis and Paddy Moore identified in it. So that's another thing I'm pleased about with the book. Yeah, for good reason. Uh, and and I, I want to make sure that people know where they can go and grab a copy. I know there was a, a time because it came out last month where people were having a hard time getting it. But I think that time has passed. Where can uh, listeners and viewers get your book after humanity? The best place to get it is through the publisher's website. I know lots of people will want to go to Amazon, but I would strongly advise people to go to the publisher's website, wordonfire.org forward slash humanity. And I say that because if you buy After Humanity, you get through the publisher automatically a free copy of The Abolition of Man <laughs> with a matching <laughs> cover. Exactly. So the publishers of The Abolition of Man have kindly redesigned the, the front cover so that it ties in with the cover of After Humanity. And you get two books effectively for the price of one if you order through the publisher. Exactly. But I don't, think, I don't think you do get that offer if you go through Amazon. So no. it's much best to go through wordonfire.org forward slash humanity and um, um, I was going to say something else there, but I've completely lost my train of thought. Sorry. Uh, we, we've we kept you long past, or not quite long past, I hope, uh, but a little bit past the hour. So I'm sure you're uh, ready to wind down. Uh, but I, I would say to my viewers and listeners, I've talked about Bishop Barron before. I don't know if it had something to do with Ward on Fire and, and his uh, him being at the helm. Uh, he's a wonderful intellectual that I enjoy reading and listening to. So for those of you who, who have, like me, a Catholic background, which is why I asked you that question earlier, uh, or who enjoy um, Barron's works, you know, it's a great organization to support, uh, aside from the perks of getting a free copy of The Abolition with uh, your guide after humanity. So um, thank you so much. This has been stimulating for me, and I'm sure probably going to be one of the most popular episodes for Mythic Mission. So thank you again, Dr. Ward. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>